semester of the, a series of six lectures. And um, I wanted to welcome uh, Joel Metzger, who is the uh, director of uh, general manager of Utica, and he was hired at that position in July 13, 2021. Before that, in 2014, he was hired by the Calaveras County Water District as a member of the management team. Over the next six years, he served as head of external affairs, grant writing, water conservation, customer service, and legislative advocacy. Mr. Mesquier was raised in Calaveras County and currently lives in Valcito with his wife, Emily, three-year-old daughter, Kate, and three-month-old son, William. Outside of work, he enjoys mountaineering, traveling, photography, landscaping, gardening, tennis, golf, skiing, and spending time with his family. And I want to uh, welcome uh, Joel to our lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you for that generous introduction. Um, I'm so thrilled to be with you today. Um, to share a little bit about something that I've become very passionate about, which is Utica Water and Power Authority. And um, I'm going to go over a few things with you today, and I just want to kind of give you an outline for what I'm hoping to touch on. Uh, so I, I wanted to go over these things with you today. So I'm hoping that by the time everyone leaves today, you'll have a general idea of what Utica Water and Power Authority is, what the history of UWPA is, um, where it's located geographically, and um, how does the water get to Angels Camp and Murphy's and the agricultural folks who rely on our system? And then also, what are the short and long-term challenges that we are facing as an organization? And then finally, there's a, a role for you at the end, and that's how you can help. How, how can you be involved in, in making this uh, a success? Um, so let's get into it. Right off the bat, I want to let you know that there are some tools that you can utilize to keep in touch with us and keep apprised. So just take notes of that. Um, check out our webpage. We redid it this year. A lot of good information there. Also, we have a Facebook page and an Instagram. As I was saying, follow us um, on social media. Check out our website. And then uh, keep an eye for, for various news releases that we'll be putting out. So let's get started. What is Utica Water and Power Authority? Well, it has a very, very long history going back to the very beginning. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the current iteration is. So UWPA was um, founded in 1996 and formed. It's a joint powers uh, authority. And we have two members. So we have the city of Angels Camp as a member, and we have uh, Union Public Utility District as a member. And so we were formed to make sure that the water supply kept coming down the hill to provide our members, Angels Camp and Murphy's, and some agricultural folks with the water that they need uh, to use our local resources and allow us to grow and, and produce food um, in various ways. So that's really our main purpose, and that's our mission, is to keep that water coming down the hill. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, we have some pre-1914 water rights, uh, about 33,000, 34,000 acre feet a year in the great years, um, but we do have to get good rain and snow to have that much water coming down the hill. And in bad years, that might be cut in half, all the way down to about 16,000 acre feet. So um, I do have some questions for the audience. You'll see uh, in blue, and so I'm just going to throw these out once in a while. So does anyone know what the significance of a pre-1914 water right is? And if you do have an idea, raise your hand. And if not, I'll tell you. <laughs> not under federal jurisdiction? Or? So we have, it's not under federal jurisdiction. So you're right on the right vein there. So 1914 was the cutoff for when the State Water Resources Control Board took control of the water rights system, when that's a state agency. And if you have water rights prior to that, they're called senior water rights, and they're not under the jurisdiction of that state water board. Although we're seeing recently, they're trying to say that they are under their jurisdiction, and there's going to be a legal fight coming. But I guess my point is, the fact that we have rights in, from 1853, uh, that for most of our water, that's extremely, extremely um, senior, and, and no one can really take that water from us. Whereas if you had water from 14 plus, uh, people could probably take that from you more easily and, uh, and curtail you. So that's really important. And then here's another question, because I'm going to be using the word acre foot a lot today. So does anyone know what an acre foot of water is? If you have an idea, raise your hand. Okay, right here, sir. The acre builds the depth of one foot. Right on. 
Very good. So I'm going to show that to you. Oh, sorry. So it's one acre filled to one foot depth. And I like to use the football field example. Um, you can kind of see most of a football field will be covered to one foot depth of water. It's about 325,000 gallons of water. And then down at the bottom, you can see a family of four generally uses about one of those a year for their needs, indoor and outdoor. And the state would like us to use about a quarter of that. So that's the direction that they're going. They want all of us to use less. So uh, moving on, who, who am I leading? I'm leading 10 people, and we're maintaining a 27-mile long system. It starts up in Avery, and it works its way all the way down to Angels Camp. And um, we have five reservoirs on that system, and we have 17 wooden flumes, uh, which you'll see a lot of pictures of today. And then we have a lot, a lot, a lot of ditch, which is an earthen ditch that's lined with gunite, which is a type of concrete. And that's how we bring your water down the hill. And then along the way, we spin two hydroelectric plants. One of them is just about a half mile this way um, on Booster Way in Angels Camp. <laughs> and then the second plant, which is our larger one, is up in Murphy's. And you'll see that if you're just leaving Murphy's and heading up the Utica grade on your right, there's a little pond there. And at the top end of that, there's a concrete structure and some electrical looking lines. That's our switch yard. So this is the handout, which I don't think I had enough for everyone. I apologize, but hopefully you've had a chance to look at it and you can refer to it today. This is the Utica system map. And so starting way up in the high country here, you might recognize Alpine, Utica, Union, Spicer. These are all part of our system going all the way back to the 1800s and early 1900s. And then those uh, hold the water and release them throughout the summer, and then it comes down here, which is just below Big Tree State Park to McKay's. We pick it up there, and I'm going to go through this in more detail a little later. And then our system begins in Avery, and it's the green line going all the way down. And then our water eventually ends up in the same watershed where it began, North Fork Stanislaus, and uh, goes into New Maloney's, whatever we don't use. So let's jump into a little history. Uh, I have Judith Marvin in the front row here. I'm probably going to get some stuff wrong, so don't be afraid to say, hey, it was actually 1895, not 99. And so I apologize. And Martin Hubbardy also um, has a lot of uh, great historical knowledge. And his, uh, his house is going to be pictured here. So again, uh, my dates may not be perfect, but Judith, by the way, is helping me do a historical um, web page that tells this whole story. And we're going to be launching that soon. And I'm really excited. So that's actually being built by our web designer in the next couple weeks. So uh, there are some key eras. Uh, the first era is 1852, when it all began, when the Union Water Company was formed. And then you have uh, the 1946 to 96 era. That's the Pacific Gas and Electric ownership years. And then you have 1996 to present. And that is the current uh, day version of Utica Water and Power. So uh, this all kind of started with the gold rush. I think everyone's aware that's when people really started coming here who, who didn't uh, originate here. And uh, so I just kind of wanted to remind you that you know gold was found a little north of here first, but then it was quickly found in our rivers, the Calaveras, the Stanislaus, the McCollumy, Angels Creek. And that started bringing a lot of people to this area. And I just have a couple fun facts here that I found interesting. So Murphy's was named after the Murphy's brother, brothers, Daniel and John. And here they are, um, some pictures of those guys. They got very, very rich here, from what I understand, and uh, did very well, along with many others. But most of the miners didn't do very well. Uh, and then Angel's Camp, Henry P. Angel. I'm not 100% sure if this is him, but this is the only photo I found that might be him. So Judith, you can correct me if that's not him. I think it is. Think it is? OK. And then the spelling of the A-N-G-E-L-L, -L, that's kind of one I never knew about. Now it's just Angel's with one L. My hometown, Vallecito, means Little Valley, and it was named by Mexican miners. And then you have Carson Hill, San Andreas, Copperopolis, huge copper deposits, all kind of interesting uh, names and, and how they came to be. And then this is another one that I didn't know um, until my wife started working here. Uh, but Al Alan Michelson is kind of a famous guy, and um, he, he got a Nobel Prize for measuring the speed of light. So here's your next question. Does anyone know where the original house where he grew up is in the county? Anybody? You're not fair. You're, you're, you're the last. Everybody just put Brown. OK. So why don't you tell me where it really is? It was right next door to the Murphy's Hotel. They put the sign up, 
at uh, Harvey Winery mm -hmm. because when his daughter came back to Murphy's, she was 60 years old, and she said, I think that house was where my father lived. Okay. And her aunt and my uncle lived next door at a house that was gone. So uh, if any of you read Maureen Elliott's book, she has traced every single year. Hmm. He lived upstairs over the store that his father owned. So this was pre-planned. You might have thought it was where Harvey Winery is. But it's not. So, Judith, thank you for uh, doing your part there. She said right next to the Murphy's Hotel. Was it on the Tanner side or the other side? The other side, again, it's the garden now. The, the garden, where the garden is at the Murphy's Hotel is where his, his child at home was. All right, so we're talking about gold miners. We know why they're here. They're, they're mining. Um, but one of the things that they needed was water. You know, you see a lot of gold panning going on. Um, washing uh, the gold from ore is a huge thing. So you might imagine that if you're dealing with Angel's Creek, um, it is actually just a seasonal, seasonal watershed. And you, know, you might not know that because thanks to Utica's system, it's not a seasonal watershed. It's a year-round watershed. But if Utica went away, and if you, know, you would have around May or June, depending on how wet the year was, Angel's Creek would just be dry and dusty, and there would be no water in there. And so um, the miners ran into that issue, and they needed water to continue their operations. And so um, they, they had an issue. And here's a picture of what they might have looked like, you know, what one group of miners looked like. I mean, they looked like a pretty tough bunch. And I can tell you that they were a very determined bunch based on what we're going to see that they did. So some water companies started getting formed. And these guys decided, we're going to go get a more reliable water supply for the mines. And uh, Angel's Creek clearly wasn't going to do it. And so the first one that they went to explore was Mill Creek or Love Creek or Moran Creek, whatever you want to call it. They all come together. And now it's called Mill Creek. So uh, Moran Creek kind of runs from Blue Lake Springs area, Sequoia Woods down. Love Creek is out Love Creek Road, kind of a little bit parallel to the Stanislaus, but a smaller watershed. And then they come together and form Mill Creek. And that uh, comes down into Hunter's Reservoir in the Avery area. So that was a, a little bit of a better watershed um, than Angel's, but it very soon after Avery dumps into the Stanislaus River Canyon and you, you lose it. And so they had to go and get some canals and flumes to that water and bring it down to Murphy's and Angel's camp. But soon that really wasn't enough either. And I'm experiencing that today. Uh, my flow on Mill Creek right now is about uh, 0.5 cubic feet per second. And that's not really enough water to do much of anything. Um, in the big, the big rains, you know, we may have hundreds of cubic feet, but it's, it's not a great one. So eventually, uh, they decided we're going to go all the way up to the Stanislaus River. And that's exactly what the Union Water Company was able to do. And um, I'm telling you, this is not an easy thing. Even in today's world with our current machines, it would be very difficult to put a ditch along this kind of topography. It's very steep. It's very rocky. Ravines and gullies to be crossed. It's tough. Uh, but these guys were doing it with mules and picks and shovels and water levels because the grade is extremely important. If you go too steep, you're going to erode your, your uh, canal. If you don't go uh, steep enough, the water just kind of sits there, and it doesn't move. And it still blows my mind to this day how they were able to do that with the tools that they have. Um, and Judith has a lot more information about that as well. I know I picked your brain a little bit, but it, it's really, really impressive. So uh, here's what it might have looked like for them actually building a flume. And just so you know what a flume is versus a canal, the flume is the wooden section. And why would you build a flume? Well, usually because you're crossing some kind of a ravine. And they would take too much to dig a ditch on the contour line all the way around. So it's a shorter, more direct route to just build the flume. The downsides of flume are they're hard to build, and they're made out of wood, and the wood rots. And a tree can hit it, or a boulder can roll and knock it down. Uh, canals are definitely preferred, and that's why you mostly saw those. But sometimes you needed a flume. And it, it's dangerous work. Um, now when we build things like this, I hire a scaffolding company, and they do a protective um, platform all the way around where my crew is working. So if someone fell, they wouldn't die or be maimed. Well, these guys didn't have that kind of protection back then. So there were certainly some injuries uh, constructing these kind of things. So. Um, after the Union Company was formed, they started expanding rapidly. Gold was still being mined. They needed more and more water. So that's when they uh, expanded up to the Stanislaus um, River. 
And then they also went up to the high country and they started building reservoirs way up high where they could start capturing and storing water when, during the wet season and then slowly releasing that down during the dry season. And um, they also built Elephant Rock Lake, Summit Lake, Duck Lake um, over the years uh, to store and control water. And then um, in the late 1880s, um, Union um, was transferred to the Utica Gold Mining Company. They were actually um, right near here, um, just right down the ridge here a little bit. They were, I believe, the biggest mine in the Angels Camp area, and they were very successful. Uh, they found a lot of rich ore. And um, so they were uh, in control of the company, and they were expanding it. And so uh, there was some serious growth between the 1880s and, and 1920s. You saw Lake Alpine built. You saw Union Reservoir, um, Utica. Utica Reservoir, and Spicer Meadow. And this is the old Spicer. Now we all think of this big, near 200,000 acre foot reservoir. The first one was only around 4,000 acre feet, much, much smaller. And then um, because of these efforts, this is kind of an important point that I'm grateful for. All of these reservoirs are still there, or and maybe even bigger. And without those, we wouldn't have the water supply that we do. So I think we owe a lot to these gold miners who were thinking ahead. And maybe they built them for mining, but they are our consumptive water supply. And, and I'm very grateful, especially in the drought that's going on right now, for all this investment. And then uh, lower on the system, we had Ross Reservoir built. That's on French Gulch Road, for anyone who's driven through Murphy's area. Um, the Ross Dam was not a great one in the beginning. It actually failed a couple times. And um, so now the dam, which is still there, is mostly rock. But where the failure point was, it's an earthen mound. And so it's kind of a hybrid dam now. Um, it seems to be in good shape. You know, We monitor it pretty closely. It hasn't failed in over 100 years at this point. It's kind of a cool picture of, uh, of Ross. And I just wanted to show you what it looks like Today, this is a very similar angle. Um, so there it is back in 1895, and here it is today. And that, um, this is where the rock ends, and the rest of this over here is that earth dam. It's about a 100 acre foot. Timers like to stand on the dam, and the goats like to stand on it now. So, yes. So the question is, were those upper reservoirs like Utica Union Alpine were they natural lakes that were expanded on, or were they just built right on a ravine somewhere? I don't 100 percent know, um, but looking at the topography of Utica and Union. Uh, they just dammed uh, what would have been a, a regular stream. Um, Alpine, it seems like the same thing, but there certainly could have been a small lake there, potentially. But I don't want to tell you for sure. Martin? It was Silver Lake, wasn't it? Silver Lake No, Alpine. called Silver Valley. Silver Valley, but there was a... There were, no, it was a creek that ran through there. Oh, the creek, sorry. So I'm not 100% sure. Yes? So the question is about water rights that we have and if someone could take them. And I'm actually going to address that a little later. So I'll from, from, from here, yeah. From the Utica powerhouse. So in the late 1890s, powerhouses started being constructed in this area. And um, it was kind of a, a new and novel thing. I'm, so I think west of the Mississippi, there really wasn't a whole lot like this. And so this was a, a really groundbreaking thing. Angel's got some electricity. Murphy's got some electricity. And so this was used to run bigger and bigger equipment for the mines. Um, so here is, I apologize for the uh, flickering. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Um, but this is a, the construction of the old Utica powerhouse, um, which is now owned by Martin. And I want to show you one more really cool picture. I just love this one. Um, this is on the old powerhouse road, which is right parallel to Highway 4, leaving Murphy's. And you can still drive by this, but look at how denuded that hillside is compared to now. I mean, that's covered in live oak and pines and, and manzanita and all, black oaks, all kinds of stuff. But it's just, yeah, poison oak, that's right. 
Um, but how cool, I mean, it's just so neat to see, you know, what it was like then. And then this is a picture of it now. Um, you can see how wood it is behind there. Uh, this is a picture of the actual um, turbines that were installed in that powerhouse. And this is 1901, and it says 12,000 horsepower. So uh, just really, really cool to look and back on that. those machines are here. OK, whereabouts are they? Just, just between the two buildings on the okay. right hand side. Wonderful. All right, so these machines are, are right here. Um, again, just kind of giving you a flavor. M Main Street Murphy's in the 1800s. Uh, that's the Murphy's Hotel. Here's another uh, shot. There's the Murphy's Hotel. And then, you know, here's what it looks like today. Still, still moving along. It's just incredible. Some of this stuff has survived. Um, here we have the, the Utica Mine. So which dams in particular? The high country ones or? So Utica and Union are definitely accessible um, from a Forest Service road. And then the Slick Rock Road comes down near their dams on, uh, from Alpine as well. So you can get out there for sure. And there's a nice campground on the Utica Reservoir, which I, I spend a lot of time camping there. And then Spicer Dam is also public. Um, you can go and see that, and there's a campground there. Alpine, uh, I think it's a little harder to get back to the dam now because there's some private property there. But you can walk around the reservoir, and you can see that as well. And then. Um, our dams that we own, like Ross Reservoir and Hunters, those are more secure because we're under a FERC license and we don't have a public access mandate. And so we tend to want to keep those fenced off because we wouldn't want anyone to get hurt out there. Um, but if you ever wanted to see one, you know, let me know and I, I'd be happy to take you out there and you know, we could take a look. Cayman? Would some of these, uh, the pictures you have of the large flume, the large, long flume, would they be So we do have some siphons on the system. Um, we could put pipe in, but it wouldn't be a siphon because the flume is virtually flat with just a tiny bit of grade. And a siphon is usually used, um, well, OK, I see. If we were going to go down through the ravine and then come back up the other side, um, we, would, we would only use that if it wasn't super rocky and hard to dig deep enough to, to mount the siphon. And so they made the decisions where a siphon would work and where a flume would work, and we kind of stuck to that. But you're right. You could do a siphon if you had the right topography and the tools to dig. And that would be a little bit more resistant to natural disaster than the wood flume would be. Oh, it's still happening. OK, so this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, we believe this is out in Big Valley. Judy, tell me if I'm wrong. No, it's right below. Um where Lock Vineyards is, it's in that area. Okay, so coming into Murphy's on Highway 4, heading east, somewhere in that area. Just so cool that they went out and celebrated Flume, you know, in full, full regalia. This is, this is an area a siphon probably wouldn't work. Um, you're just kind of clamping it onto the hillside. This is out at three quarter mile. Uh, we, I'll show you what this looks like today. So this is, it did. Yep, one of seven flumes to burn. Um, so this is, this is one of our toughest areas to repair and also the most vulnerable to natural disaster. So this is located kind of between um, Darby, Red Apple going down, and then below Forest Meadows. Um, if you were going to go out Wild Ridge, where that maybe nine or ten houses is up on the ridge above Forest Meadows, you, and then you went through the lock gate, you dropped straight down to the lower end. My guys walk this regularly because if anything boulder rolled down or a tree fell or it just failed, we have to know about that right away. Okay. Lot, lots of walking is done on this system to ensure that things are okay. Um, so PG&E, speaking of PG&E, I don't have a whole lot on PG&E and I would actually throw this out there. If anyone has information on the PG&E era, photos, documents, anything, I can't find anything and I really want to flesh that section out of the web page that I'm building. So uh, just, you know, if you know someone who worked there, let them know that I'm interested in that information. Um, they did improve the system substantially. Um, they were able to buy it from the Utica Gold Mining Company because there just really wasn't a whole lot of mining going on in the mid-40s anymore following the war. And um, so they built some new powerhouses. They put a lot of new gunite canal in. You know, they rebuilt flumes continuously. They took good care of the system. And I would note that the system was much bigger under PG&E than it is now because from Avery, 
the system went another eight or nine miles to the actual Stanislaus River on grade. And the only reason why that isn't there today is there's a tunnel that was drilled under that same area and now we can tap that tunnel. I'm going to show you some pictures of that. Um, I would say it took a lot of people for PG&E to run this system because they didn't have the computer monitoring that we do now. So you actually had to physically be present to make sure that things weren't wrong. And uh, so it was a labor intensive um, endeavor. And then in the late 80s and 90s, after years of negotiating, PG&E did sell the project to Calaveras County Water District in partnership with Northern California Power Agency. And that whole deal culminated in the North Fork project. And so the North Fork project was a, a very big project. It cost about 650 million. And the deal was CCWD would put up the water rights and kind of be the owner of the project. And Northern California Power Agency would put up the money. So they actually raised the money from their members, which is from Silicon Valley up to Redding and everywhere in between. They have, I think, 20 plus members. And this is just one of a, a much larger suite of energy projects that they have. So they built new Spicer, which took Spicer from 4,000 acre feet to 189,000 acre feet. They built a powerhouse at the base of new Spicer Dam. They also built the North Fork Diversion, which diverts water from Alpine, Utica, and Union into Spicer so they can store it in their bigger reservoir. And then going downstream, they built McKay's Reservoir, which is an on-stream concrete arch dam. And the whole purpose of that is to divert water from the Stanislaus and from the upcountry reservoirs into this 18-foot diameter tunnel, which carries it to the Collierville Powerhouse. And that powerhouse is at the end of Camp Nine Road. And it's a 253 megawatt powerhouse, the biggest one in this county by far. My biggest powerhouse is 3.6 megawatts. Yeah. Theirs is 253. And so um, that's why that section of flume is no longer there, because that tunnel goes right under Avery, and we were able to tap it and abandon a massive amount of, of flume. So that's the history. Um, thanks, Judith. Thanks, Martin. There's a lot more that's going to be on that web page uh, and organized uh, in, in an easier to follow fashion. So I hope you check that out. I'll make sure to share that link when it's posted. Uh, this is one of my favorite photos. This is looking down in the Stanislaus River Canyon at sunset. This is Flume 10. And um, yeah, I just I love being out there it, it, in the, the sunrise and the sunset and just seeing what it's like to be on that canyon wall. It's really, really special. So our watershed um, is the Stanislaus River watershed, the North Fork, not the middle or south. This is actually showing all of them. And um, it's interesting, a lot of our, our water isn't actually originating in Calaveras County. It's, it's, a lot of it's in Alpine, a lot of it's in Tuolumne actually, but it just happens to come over to the Stanislaus, which is the boundary of the two counties. I uh, just want to show you pictures, you know, these, this is great recreation areas. You've got Uta, Utica, Union, Alpine up there. I love playing up there, and anyone who hasn't been up there, I hope you go take a look. Um, this is the, the North Fork Stand coming through big trees. I took this picture after going for a hike, and it, it's a gorgeous river, some of the cleanest water you're going to find anywhere in the state, and uh, we're very fortunate to be drinking this water. And then this is McKay's. Uh, this is McKay's, that on-stream concrete dam that I told you about. This is when it's spilling. Uh, NCPA doesn't normally want McKay's to spill because they want to put this through their powerhouse. And so they try to not spill it. But if there's a big enough storm or series of storms, then um, they have to spill it. You know, it's an uncontrolled spill. And uh, you know, this, this river really doesn't run above about 20 to 25,000 cubic feet per second, even during a big storm. Um, historically over the project's life, but they have had a couple storms where it was over 30, nearing 40,000 CFS. That's big water, uh, scary water, actually, moving boulders type of water. Uh, but for the most part, you know, it's only running, you know, a couple thousand CFS. And, and right now it's only running by natural flow, maybe under 10 CFS. That's how bad this drought is. If any of those dams weren't there, it would be uh, basically a stream you could just walk across. I have a question in the back. Yeah.
The Stanislaus River watershed is the power source for this project. We've got seven reservoirs. Some are up high near the crest of Ebbets Pass. And when that snow melts, it fills those reservoirs. And some of it overflows our upper reservoirs and comes down to our largest reservoir, New Spicer Meadows. And then we store that water and we capture it until it's needed. This large network of reservoirs gives us the freedom to actually store power by storing water, releasing it when energy needs are the greatest. To allow a certain outflow to maintain the Stanislaus River between there and Camp 9 and the Collierville So the question is, is there a required release into the, the riverbed um, so the river doesn't go dry between their diversion dam? And yes, um, it's about 16 CFS, and it does vary a little bit up and a little bit down depending on the, the, the time of year. Uh, recreate, there's a recreation component to it, but the main component is environmental to make sure that whatever aquatic life is in the river can, can survive. And um, interesting, the, I won't get into the dam debate, but right now, if there weren't dams, a lot of aquatic life would be dying this year because the river would, would be almost gone or gone. <clears throat> All right, here's an aerial of McKay's, kind of looking downstream. And I just wanted to point out that tunnel tap structure. So again, this whole thing was built to get that water into that tunnel tap. And then you can kind of see this is where that waterfall was. It spills right there. <clears throat> this is inside the tunnel. I've never been in there. They really don't want to uh, dewater it because the rock could collapse and then we'd all have a big problem. Um, so they generally examine this with ROVs now. Um, but it, I've been in one of the adits, which is a, a tunnel that goes to the side where they can remove rock when they're digging or if they need to go in and, and access it. And it's, it's a really, I mean, it just feels like a giant cave. It's, it's unbelievable to be in this thing. And for this to be nine miles long, I mean, what an accomplishment. And not just nine miles long, but to hit their marks, you know, to get it right where it wants and then drop it down 2,000 feet to the powerhouse, you know, to have over 1,000 PSI is also really, really impressive. So the question was, do they access it with cameras? Yes. They go in with a, a remote operated vehicle, an ROV. And they do that. They're actually um, doing that right now. So I, I can't use anything uh, from the tunnel tap. The question is, does Tuolumne County own water rights on the Stanislaus? No. Tuolumne County owns no water rights. And that's why they're currently trying to buy the PG&E project, uh, which is Pinecrest and Lyons. And they're in talks right now. Don't know if it's going to happen or not. But they're trying to regain water rights that they sold long, long ago. So this is the Collierville powerhouse. It kind of looks unimpressive, but that's the 253 megawatt generator, which all of that 650 million was spent to bring water right here. And uh, that green bridge gets you over to a really cool swimming hole if you ever want to go check that out. <laughs> OK. So we used to have a system that went from hunters all the way up to the river, eight more miles of flume and canal. That's gone. Now we just tap that tunnel, 36-inch diameter pipe straight up. And head pressure, because that tunnel's sloping down, head pressure pushes that water right up, no pumping required. And it pushes it up into this big concrete building. And then there's a Howell Bunger valve, which is a dissipation valve. So that water's slamming into that, and it's being dissipated, and then it's hitting a concrete wall, and it's falling down, and then it's flowing out into that little exit right there. And then it just goes into the canal. And that's the beginning of our, our 27-mile system. And I would also say, Right below here, there's another pipe that comes off that 36 inches, and that goes over to the Calaveras County Water District's Hunter's Water Treatment Plant. And they treat water for about 6,000 customers from Avery all the way up to Camp Connell, Dorrington, Arnold. All those communities are served by this same tunnel tap. So needless to say, this tunnel is rather important to our community. And if anything ever happened to it, I don't have a backup other than if Mill Creek happens to be flowing, uh, but then we're in the same uh, bind that the miners were in if that tunnel ever fails. Because my uh, eight miles of flume that went to the river are gone. We, aban we aban abandoned those. 
Uh, this is an aerial of Hunter's Reservoir. This is real close to Avery Middle School, kind of down below Avery Middle School's field. And uh, so the tunnel tap water comes in here. Here's our arch concrete dam. This is a bypass flume. And then this is our main release from the bottom of Hunter's. And this is what's coming down to serve all of you and Murphy's and Angel's Camp and all the farmers in between. So just another view. This is about a 130 foot tall dam. And um, comes in there, fills it up, goes out here. And then up here is where Mill Creek comes in. So we have two sources of water that come into Hunter's. A 350 acre foot reservoir. So this is just an example of what most of the system looks like. Beautiful canal lined with concrete. picture of uh, one of the flumes on the canyon's edge, flume 10. This is three-quarter mile flume, the most challenging flume that we have. Uh, it's really tough to rebuild that, very expensive to rebuild that. And this is the one that the Darby fire took out. The Darby fire started down in the canyon in 2001 in September, and it just swept right up the hillside, and there was really nothing we could do to protect this, and the firefighters weren't going to put themselves at risk. Yes? So are you referring to the, the limitations we have? Yeah. Uh, so these are historical. They're recognized as historic, as historic. And so when we do rebuild something, we can't just do whatever we want. Um, we can't use a new material. Uh, we can't change the look and character of it. We need to keep it looking the way that it is. And so uh, the Darby fire burned this one and some other flumes. And um, I think it's a lot of people thought, well, maybe we, maybe we should make this out of metal, or maybe we should put a pipe in, or maybe we should do something else. But so the insurance uh, plus FEMA and Cal OES, they, they kind of said, hey, you need, we'll give you money to rebuild what you had. And then the historical um, uh, aspect of it as well, you know, we weren't allowed to build something else. And so back in that time, they rebuilt it with wood uh, just the way it was. Uh, there was some permission for some metal girders to go in. And so that was really great, because that certainly has a longer life than, a, it's called a stringer, which is like a eight by 12 by 16 foot long big hunk of board, which is what most of this is supported by. Um, so coming on down the hill, uh, past three quarter mile and the other 17 wooden flumes that we have, we provide water to Union Public Utility District, which is, uh, serves Murphy's. And this is their main storage pond called Catamotri Reservoir and they treat it right below there, and they serve all of Murphy's, and then they also serve the North Ditch and the South Ditch. And so that's a bunch of agricultural customers. And those used to be open ditches, and now uh, they're, they're all piped. And then keep it on coming down the system, it goes into the Murphy's <coughs> four bay, and then we release water into our penstock, and this is the penstock right below the Murphy's four bay dam, and that's heading down into the Murphy's powerhouse. Okay, your next question. Museum people can't answer. What is the name of what you're seeing here? What is this contraption? I'm going to give you a hint. This is seven feet in diameter. It may look small, but this is seven feet in diameter. Anybody have any idea what this is called? Pelton wheel. Pelton wheel. Good. Very good, Pop. Yeah, very well done. And I, I want to tell you how it works. So these are all cups. 
And this, 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 and this, six of them, these are jets, which we call needles. And that is a stainless steel milled, kind of looks like a teardrop. And so um, what we do is these are called deflectors. See how they're kind of in the way of the needle? They're between the needle and that cup. So when we want to start this thing up, we hydraulically pull those back. So all these pull back, and they're all linked. So there's a really cool linkage in this plant. So it all happens together. And then we hydraulically pull these needles. These are the needle seats. We pull them back. And that allows water to rush around the needles and then shoot out where that point is. And it forms a very strong, powerful jet. And it hits these uh, cups. And then this thing starts rotating counterclockwise in this picture. And then it goes faster and faster until you're at hundreds and hundreds, and in some cases, thousands of RPM. And this is connected to a, a turbine shaft which goes all the way up and transitions that mechanical energy into electrical energy. And that's what we push out onto the grid and sell to PG&E and others. So this is how we are making power on all three of our plants. And you just replaced those needles too, right? We just put some new needles in recently. And each one of those needles, after it's machined, is like five grand. It's extremely expensive because they're pure stainless steel. Uh, anybody know what this is called? these things relays this these are relays and so we have a bunch of these because this plant was built in the 40s and the crazy part now is we could take like that entire panel all everything you see there and we could probably put three computers in and it would do the same thing and more but we don't have the money for that so we're we're using these guys and we can't go buy these parts on the shelves that they fail so uh, it's, it's very tenuous because when something breaks, you kind of have to fix it. You can't just go buy a new one. And, and, and the purpose of a relay is if there's a problem, it will trip the plant and, and protect the plant from having a failure. So it's their protection devices. So here's that view that you can see from Highway 4, which is right there. Here's old Utica Powerhouse Road, um, just above Murphy's. And here's our spillway from that same reservoir. Uh, so, so all of our water comes down, goes to UPUD, then it comes here after it spins that turbine, and then it goes through here. But this after bay also is on Angel's Creek, and up there they call it Murphy's Creek, but it's actually called Angel's Creek. <laughs> um, so what I want you to understand is this water in Murphy's Park during the summer is 100% in my team's control. We decide on our phone how much we want that flow to be because of how much power we want to make and how, how much our, our users need. But in the winter, and, and, and please tell your friends this is not natural. It's kind of, they should know, you know, this is, this is a benefit that wouldn't be here without this system. Um, and this is a real benefit. You know, my family personally, my kids, we love going out here and I see the events there and all the tourists who come in, they love to go in this creek. It, it really is an economic benefit to this community. But then this happens. And, <laughs> and then I get phone calls saying, why did you do this to our park? So if you would also tell your friends in the same sentence that in the wintertime, because it is on a natural watershed, which is Angels Creek, which is about a four square mile watershed, and it just rains cats and dogs, and you get inches and hours, I actually can't control that. Because as soon as my after bay is full, it's an uncontrolled spill. And it just, whatever water is there goes into this park and downstream, and it's going to flood it. And, I, and the only thing I can do is stop making power. Um, you know, our ditch runs about 60 CFS at the most, and we do. You know, we don't want to add 60 CFS to this, even this, if this is thousands, and that's kind of not making that big of a difference. So we do turn our plants off, and all the water that's coming down uh, our system, you know, we turn our valves off from hunters, the tunnel taps off. But you know, a ditch is actually catching runoff. And we have 27 miles of runoff catching ability. And so the rain is running into our ditch and filling it up. And the ditch is running like crazy, even though we're not putting anything into it. And that's tough. So I have to have my conveyance guys go out and do what's called a, a wastegate crossgate maneuver. So they bring a gate down that crosses the ditch and blocks it. And they open up a, a ramp that just goes off the canyon wall. And all that water hits that and just gets dumped. But then another mile of catching more runoff, all of a sudden you have the same problem again. So in the worst storms, you have multiple wastegate cross gates open. And um, even then, there might be some water getting into the forebay. And we're just going to pass that down, not make power, and just push it down the creek. 
So then below Murphy's, a few miles downstream, right off the grade road, there's a diversion dam. Diversion dam right here. Here's the fish flow that you asked about in the back there. We have a 5 CFS requirement. Uh, it's a pretty good stream down below there. And then um, we divert most of the water out to our lower system, which is the, the Angels Canal. And there are some flumes down there. This is our biggest one. It's called File Flume. This one was recently rebuilt. You can see those from the grade road. And then I don't know if you've seen our most famous feature, but ours is the one system in the world where water runs uphill. If you've seen the grade road, you see where it actually goes uphill there for a while. So keep an eye out for that driving down for Murphy's. And then it continues uh, through some ranch land and ends up in Ross Reservoir. We, we know about Ross. And we use this as the Angels Camp water supply backup. So if we ever had a flume fail, you have quite a number of days of water right here, especially if everyone's conserving. So this is very important for, for drought and for, for emergency. And then here it runs along um, down to the city. Beautiful, much smaller. This is only 45 CFS. The upper one could run 88 CFS in its heyday. And this is right above Tryon's property. The grade road is running right along down here. I just wanted to show you, this is the ag that our system allows in our area. So um, everything I circled is some kind of irrigated something. And without this system, we wouldn't have that. <clears throat> So the water from the lower canal ends up in the forebay. This is a sunset shot in the forebay. This is a tiny, and it's right up on the hill here above Rolleri's Rock Yard, kind of where the tank is. It's right next to the water treatment plant. And um, from there, it goes three ways. It goes to the city treatment plant. It goes to the Dogtown ditch during irrigation season. And then most of it goes in the penstock coming to our second plant down here. Um, and this is a picture of that penstock. So if you've ever seen that big gray pipe on the grade road, that is bringing water to our powerhouse. And this is Mr. O'Leary's irrigated pasture. Um, and we have 16 customers, including Mr. O'Leary, across the whole system who buy water from us and irrigate. They don't have water rights. They are a contractor, and we approve them yearly. And if there was a drought and the city needed water and we didn't have enough, they would get cut off and the city would get water, because you are the partner. And so same thing with Murphy's. They're our main partners. Here's a picture of the plant in Angel's Camp, 1.4 megawatts, built in the 40s. And here's your next question. When water is leaving a powerhouse and going back into a, a pond or a river, what is that called? Anybody know? Tail race. Tail race. Very good. Wow, I'm impressed. The tail race. So this is the tail race going out of our plant. And this is Tryon Park. If everyone knows where Tryon Park is, that's where the old swimming pool used to be, right there. Oh, and by the way, Greenhorn Creek buys water from the city just downstream of here, and that's the last user that pumps out of this creek before it goes into Maloney's. And so Greenhorn uses a mixture of treated water and creek water, but creek water doesn't have any smell, and it's available. So they actually use a lot of creek water to keep everything green. Question in the back. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so don't tell any fishermen this, but this canal is packed full of trout because they do make it through from the Hunter's Reservoir. Um, I don't know if they make it through the tunnel tap, but they're, they're in there. And so when we have to dewater it in November, which we do every year for maintenance, you know, any pocket of water where, where there is some water left, it's full of, of fish. Um, we don't chew them up in our turbines because wherever we have an intake from a, a forebay, we have a series of screens. And they're too small for the fish to fit through. Um, but that's great for fish, but it's bad for pine needles because the pine needles just and the oak leaves just pack those things. And so during the, the leaf fall area, we are cleaning these. They're called grizzlies and, and fish screens constantly because otherwise no water gets through or minimal water gets through. So it definitely helps the fish, but my, uh, my staff do not like them at all. <laughs> um, OK, bear with me. We're on the final leg here. I know this has been a long presentation, so we're, we're going to wrap this up here. So what are some challenges that we are facing? Well, our infrastructure is 150 years old. <laughs> That's something that is, is uh, pretty tough, even older than that. So. Um, it's expensive to replace and repair the infrastructure, and we don't have enough money for it. So that's a constant balance to what do we replace? What's our priority? How do we determine that priority? And um, 
Uh, also, we, all, we haven't always been very proactive with our maintenance uh, at Utica. And that may be a financial thing or just a management style, but generally it was kind of let's fix it when it breaks. And I'm trying to change that narrative to let's identify what probably will break and let's repair it and try to get a grant to leverage those funds and let's do that before we have an emergency because FEMA did some kind of a study I think it's like five or six times more expensive to do an emergency repair than it is to do one that you've planned and so we were trying to get more onto that approach for this system but even with that approach you know I probably have a hundred million dollars of projects that I need to do and I'm never really going to get there unless all of your water bills went up by hundreds of percent thousands of percent and I'm not going to do that so it's always a balance between what do we have to do and what would we like to do all right so this is let me make it bigger this is a flume that we need to take down and rebuild so my guys are chainsawing there they have like uh, grinding wheel saws and they're just cutting this thing into pieces. And that's lined with aluminum sheeting to prevent leaks. They used to just be wood. And then um, we're getting down to uh, the bottom of it. So we're taking that out. These are all box boards that are rotten. Those are the big stringers in the very bottom, those huge boards. And they're on a support structure made out of more stringer type, six by six. And then if you see the orange, we have inmate crews from CAL FIRE and CDCR that help us. And without them, I would never be able to afford any of this. And so we're actually changing stringers out because they're rotting. So we need to bring new ones in um, so that will last. And so basically reverse that, and that's how we would rebuild it. So that's called Flume 9, and we rebuilt that in about six days. Wow. Yeah. With how many people, Joel? So we had about six on our crew. And we had uh, 15 or 30 inmates, depending on the day. Okay. All right. And that was a about a 65-foot long flume, and a three-quarter mile flume is like 3,500 feet long. To give you an idea of how much more we need to be replacing. Are those supplies brought in by helicopters? We've never had helicopters. PG&E used helicopters quite a bit. I would love to have a helicopter. Um, <laughs> my team would love to have a helicopter. We have inmates. They're our helicopter. And by the way, um, due to state policies, they have basically been releasing these folks or shutting the camps down. And so we went from having like five crews here, and there was one over in baseline where there were crews there. And now we have one or two crews here. And so my labor pool, Cal Fire basically said, you don't count on them. You're not going to get them anymore. And it's me and 10, 20, 30 other public agencies, the school district, the county, all the other water and sewer agencies, they all use these folks and count on them. And um, I don't know how this worked out, but they were able to reserve some time for me this year, even though they said they wouldn't. As long as there isn't a fire, you're always crossing your fingers that there isn't a fire, because that's their number one job. So I'm hoping that we're going to get some help. Otherwise, we're going to be lifting every single board uh, with those six guys. OK, another big challenge, Regu regulatory agencies. So anybody heard of FERC before, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, DSOD? Division of Safety of Dams. FERC are the feds, DSOD are the local guys in the state. Uh, DSOD has decided they're gonna be the new FERC after Orville, because they kind of got embarrassed when Orville failed. And um, so I'm looking at like 150, 300,000 a year just to do the studies that they need and pay the, fee the fines and fees and comply with all these inspections. Because we have big dams, and if they failed, they could hurt people. And we take it very seriously, but it's expensive. Um, you know, if my dams failed in Murphy's, a lot of Murphy's park area and the low-line areas would be flooded. So we do have to be very careful and do what's called inundation map studies. Um, I think this is going to continue to go up. I don't think it's going to go down. And then we talked about uh, state historic preservation. So a lot of the system is historical and needs to be protected. And we have agreements in our FERC license for what we will and won't do. And we check in with uh, the Forest Service and others whenever we want to maybe make a change to that. 
Um, Judy's been involved in actually writing the historical significance and the plan for it, and she, her work is, is part of this entire license that we have. And uh, we check in with her um, when we wanna maybe make changes. So we're actually talking about if we needed to try to pull one of these flumes out of protection so I could rebuild it with metal so it maybe wouldn't burn, what's the process there? And it's a lengthy one, but it is possible to do that. But, but we would need to mitigate the loss. And so one of the ideas that we have is if we could build a, a flume, just the way we have them out on the hill, maybe at the museum here, or maybe over at the Red Barn Museum in San Andreas, and then have an information placard and, and a web page with all the information about that, well, maybe that would be enough to mitigate the loss of having it out on the hill. So those are some conversations that I've been having to, to see if we can um, harden those flumes. This is, this is what happens if you don't harden them. This, is, this used to be where the wooden flume was. This is when it was rebuilt. This is all Darby fire. Uh, this is three quarter mile section. Uh, it's scary, I mean, how fast they can just be gone. And it was roughly an 11 month disruption to the community. So the only way to get water was we went upstream to where it was canal and wasn't burned. And then we put these pipes up and over the hill and then brought them down to another section where it was canal and it wasn't burned. And then we rebuilt a couple flumes that ha you know burned upstream or downstream that were shorter. And then <clears throat> it was running at like five cubic feet per second. So nothing close to what we normally would be, would be running. We weren't making power during that time. And then the inclement weather, yeah. question is, is CAL FIRE prioritizing protecting this system during a fire? And the answer is yes, they are to the extent that they can. And I've actually talked to the current TCU chief, Nick Cashy, about this. And when the Arola fire started uh, down in Parrots Ferry, I was getting pretty nervous because that's not really that far to run up the canyon and, and get to where these flumes are. And so I, I was actually over in the operations center at the sheriff's office with the chief and everyone else. And we were talking about if this doesn't get contained, what are we going to do? And so one of the things that we do is we clear as much as we can for some defensible space. But when you're on a slope like this, that you'd have to clear thousands of feet, not hundreds to actually stop that thing. So that's not really, and it's so dangerous, it's hard to even do that. And so we were um, getting maybe some, um, Retardant that you can paint on things, like uh, what's dropped out of the planes. PG&E's been doing that on power poles. We were gonna paint all of those uh, flumes just to try to give us a chance. And then certainly the air resources would be laying down a lot of retardant line and then helicopter water drops on that too. But I can tell you one thing, they were clear, they're not gonna put hand crews out there on those kind of slopes because that would just put them at too much risk. And so we can't expect that. So we need. Honestly, we, we need to find a way to, to make these out of a, a material that is more fire resistant. That's really where I want to go. So a big focus in my first year has been, how can I get grant money to study that and then get more grant money to build it? And so it's like 75% grant, 25% local match. So that's one of my big goals here at Utica is to find that grant money. I remember asking you before, but I was just wondering what the, the likelihood that you could put sprinklers on it. <laughs> Yeah, so um, you did mention that. We, I kind of talked to my team about that a little bit. Um, I think the issue would be actually powering them w in those remote areas and, and then having continuous power out there. I mean, I guess you could set generators up, but when you have 3,000 plus feet of flume, the number of sprinklers and, and the number of generators you'd have to have strung out to do that, it would be quite a, quite a thing. Um, but I think that's one that I should talk to Cal Fire about more. And uh, you know, if they think it's a good idea, certainly whatever we can do to protect this thing, I want to do. Judy. What about uh, the aluminum foil that State Parks has been <coughs> trees and? Yeah. So, this, so Judy mentioned the aluminum foil that we all saw those redwoods in Kings Canyon get wrapped with recently. Um, I actually haven't explored that with Cal Fire. It wasn't brought up at that EOC meeting, um, but. I think that's worth, worth looking into as well, and especially if it had more of a life than just like a couple months, you know, if it would give us longer term protection. That's a good idea. 
Uh, so anyway, other hazards, just winter storms. Um, we're having to walk those flumes in snow and ice. We're having to go out there and cut trees out of them or blockages um, during storms. During the winter time, during big storms, a lot of my team is out there 24 hours a day trying to keep your water flow going. And there's a lot going on in the background that people don't realize. Um, opening waste gates, clearing out grizzlies, cutting trees out. It's dangerous. Um, another thing is when Love Creek and Mill Creek really swell, they bring a bunch of logs down into hunters and they have to be passed through the spillway one by one. And if they don't get passed through, they create a log jam and then the dam could overtop and fail. So um, I haven't been here for these huge storms, but some of the stories I've heard have been really, really, really impressive. And then revenues. So uh, my main revenue is power sales. We make around a million dollars a year on power sales historically. But unfortunately, we're a renewable resource which is competing with solar and wind. And if you've seen California over the past 10 years, solar has just exploded and wind is also continuing to grow. And so what's happening is the market that we're competing in during the day when solar comes on, the market just nosedives. And so we're running 24 seven and we get very, very bad power prices. So we only have like a three hour window from like five in the evening until eight when solar is offline and if it's not windy, all of a sudden the market comes up and we can make some real money. So we used to make like 60 bucks a megawatt hour and now we're making about 26 bucks a megawatt hour. So the good news is there are some contracts where we could get a fixed price for a much, much higher um, rate. And I currently just signed one of those contracts with PG&E called Remat and that's gonna take this 26 and turn it into 73.50, which is totally not real. The market would never pay that, but California legislator passed this to encourage new plants to be built and keep existing ones going. And so we need this desperately. And even if we get that, which it looks like we will in December, we're not gonna solve that budget issue because my budget was just shy of three million and you can see what I'm making on power revenues. So how do I make that up? Well, we get some grants we sell water to irrigation customers, and really the rest of it is all of you. Um, both City of Angels and Murphy's have a line item that's called a UWPA fee on every water bill that you pay. And it's like 18 bucks up there and it varies down here based on our water year. And without that, I don't make that number. And that means I cut my infrastructure back or my reserves or I can't pay my people and so it's always a balance. Um, so yeah, we, we really count on all of you. And it, you know, during the good years with lots of water, we make more than that million. And during the bad years, maybe we'll only make 800,000. So it's, it's, it's tough. You never know what the weather's gonna do. Okay, there was a water rights question earlier. I'm here, I made it. <laughs> so protecting water rights. We have these senior water rights. They are ours. We don't have to buy them from anyone. We are using most of them to make power, and then we're putting it in the New Orleans Reservoir. So I think I have it 5,000, somewhere around 5,000 of the 33, 34 are actually being used by homes, businesses, industrial, institutional, and agriculture. And water, so that's all beneficial use, consumptive use. Power isn't really consumptive, it, you're just running a turbine and pushing it on. And so um, we would be in a better position if this number was higher. And so if we can either grow our ag or our city or our town and have a better balance and get closer to this number, then when we have to file or refile those water rights to extend them, we would have a stronger argument because the state board wants to put them to beneficial use. And so they wanna make sure that, that the person who has them is, is gonna use them for beneficial use. Um, I do think that the power does help us though because while we are not putting it to beneficial use necessarily or consumptive use, we're not taking it and putting it somewhere else. We're putting it right back in that same stream where it came from and someone downstream can use it. So I don't think there's an immediate threat to our water rights, uh, but I will say that some shots were fired this year when the state board sent me a letter that said, we're curtailing your senior rights for the first time in the history of the state water board. And I was facing not having this protection that I always thought that we did. And so luckily, we were able to work around that by using previously stored water from Spicer, Utica, Union, and Alpine, which was not curtailed. Previously stored water was not subject to that cutback. 
And so thanks to those high country reservoirs, all of you can use water close to normal. Um, but if we didn't have those reservoirs, the state would be asking all of you to use 55 gallons per person per day, indoor only, you know, let your lawn die. And um, your current usage is like around 260 gallons per person per day. So just cut your usage in, in sixths and you'd be just fine. <laughs> um, and then the long-term thing is the FERC relicensing. We only have a 30-year license for this thing. And if we don't relicense, we can't run our powerhouses anymore. And if we don't run the powerhouses, then that three million all has to come from you instead of just whatever we don't make from power. And so I'm working actively on trying to figure out how do we relicense this project in a way that doesn't break the bank and does it make sense to relicense the project. So that's a, a huge, huge issue coming up. So this is my last slide. Um, please share what you've learned today. I don't think people really know where their water comes from and how expensive it is and how hard it is to get it to you. And um, I think we should know because this is, I think, one of our most important resources. And I care about it and I think we all should care about it. And so um, I think what I'm asking is just be informed and, and stay up to date. Follow us on Facebook, check the website, and um, we'll let you know. I'll let all of you know when we have more information on the next steps for making sure that we can make sure that you have a future here. Because without water, you're limited. You're very limited. So if you want to grow or you want to um, even continue prospering, you need to have that water and you need to protect it. And so. Um, that's what I would leave you with today. I do know um, we've had a lot of questions throughout the presentation, but I'd love to, if you have any more, please ask them. And if any questions come up later, call me or email me anytime, and I'd be happy to meet with you or, or take a phone call. So with that, are there any questions from anyone? Just one. Yes, ma'am. The water is still going to Carson Hill. It terminated at... Uh, the mine and the Suttons are selling that mine and there's like a five inch meter out there that would be with that. So um, that's a UPUD connection and that's South Ditch that runs all the way to Vallecito and then out Red Hill Road and out to Carson. Yeah. Cool. Joe? Um, as an alternative, you know, you mentioned the so vulnerable fire alarm. What's the groundwater situation in this in this mine? We have access to it to be an emergency well and everything that is exploded in that. So the question was, is there groundwater along this system that could be accessed in the event of emergency or considered as part of planning in general? And the answer is yes. We're in a fractured rock area. So when I talk to geologists about our geology, they say it's a voodoo science, you know, where you're gonna get water and where you're not. Maybe your well witcher can find it with his wire crossing wires. But uh, so I would say Angels Camp has the advantage with that though, because there are some underground rivers that actually go through here. And um, they have a lot of water in them. And during the Darby fire, um, I believe there was some pumping coming out of, of one of those old mines. And, and that could happen again. And so I would say it's very possible to drill some municipal backup wells. Uh, I don't know how much water you'd get and how expensive it would be, depending on the water quality. And, and how much you got. Uh, but certainly having those would be a better situation than us losing that flume and then only having what's in Ross Reservoir to back you up. So I, I think it would be good to have at least something else that you could use. Is there a question back there? Yeah. Uh, with the drought and all the black rain and runoff, is there any problem for if this drought continues until 2022 or three? For us getting our water? Yes. Uh, if, if this drought continues at the same magnitude that it was this last wet year, then we, we will be in a very bad situation and the rest of the state will be even in a worse situation because we, we are very fortunate to have these upcountry reservoirs that we can access. Uh, but sp I'd say the key would be Spicer. As long as Spicer has some water in it, that's going to allow it to be released during the summer and go to the tunnel tap and then we can take what we need, even if it's less than normal. But if Spicer got down to where it was at Deadpool, certainly Utica Union Alpine would also be at Deadpool at that point. And there wouldn't be enough water for any of us to do what we would normally, normally do. So I think that next year, if we don't get any moisture, or very little moisture, we're all going to be making some big sacrifices. Um, 
the state as a whole is going to be in a really bad way. And that's why the state is cutting us back now, is to try to save as much water in the reservoirs as they can, so in case the next year is bad, you know, we won't just completely fail. We'll at least have some water. Um, but in terms of the delivery system, as long as there's water coming through that tunnel tap, we're always going to be able to get it to you. Even if it's 5 CFS or, or 60, we'll be able to get it to you. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I was hiking by this McKay diversion dam, and there's some old ditches in there. Is that part of the old system? Yes. Um, that's right where the old ditch came in, was at McKay's. Uh, there was, there's still a kind of a concrete structure just upstream of McKay's, and that's where the old one came in. Apparently, it was a tunnel for the beginning, and then it was a, uh, a ditch and flume from there on out. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? Yes? OK. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>